Hello everyone, Gilly here, and welcome to Less Than Enough Haskell. In this episode, I'm going to be talking about do notation and showing you kind of the basics of what do notation is all about, specifically using the maybe type. So, if you're not familiar with this game, there's this game we play in America called Rock, Paper, Scissors. I'm sure people play it other, other places as well, and um, maybe there's other variants of it out there. But the gist of the game is that there's these three components, rock, paper, scissors, you use your hands to represent them, and each component beats the other ones in a certain way, or loses to other ones. So if you have rock versus paper in any order, paper wins, it covers up the rock, which is frankly a rule I've never understood, but it's how we play. If you have scissors versus rock, the scissors are crushed by the rock, so the rock wins. If you have scissors and paper, the paper is cut by the scissors, so the scissors win. And then I'm using a list to represent the actual game, so it's actually a, a sequence of plays that will get smushed together to finally find a winner in the end. But if you have any other combination, that means that they're just repeats. I'm considering the empty state, so if you gave this an empty list, if you said play a game, but I have no hands for you, I'm considering that to be an error, and I'm just using nothing in this example to represent any kind of errors or invariants that we've broken. Any kind of thing that goes wrong, I'm just using nothing. Now, in a later video, I hope to get to that and a better way to do that, but the idea is we're gonna roll over these games, these uh, hands, if you will, and then in the end, if we have just one left, we're gonna consider that hand to be the victor. So that's the overall idea here. Now we have a couple of little helpers that are here that are gonna represent kind of the pipeline of the game, the different stages of the game. So at first, we're just gonna take in a string and then we're going to return back all of the different hands that are in play. So we're just going to parse R, P, and S out of the string. The next thing we're going to want to do is we're going to want to guard against repeats. Because at first it doesn't make sense to have repeats. Now as we're playing, we might find that there are repeats because we've eliminated um, values that... We've eliminated values that were between the repeats, but... Just for the sake of fun, we're going to add this validation step to make sure there are no repeats. So if we have scissors, scissors, paper, paper, or rock, rock, we're going to return back nothing. This is kind of just to represent how you might do validation using the maybe type and kind of to make this example a little more interesting. So our actual game then is going to look like this. And this is where I'm going to use the do notation because do notation works on um, option types. But basically we're going to parse out a game. And if nothing came back, we're going to return nothing. Then we're going to say, if there are hands, um, let's make sure there are no repeats. And if nothing came back, or an error, if there were repeats, we're going to say nothing. And then what we're going to do is we're going to say, if there were hands, we're going to play the game given those hands. So let's go ahead and let's play it playing rock, paper, scissors, paper, rock. So what would that look like really quick? Um, rock versus paper. Paper is going to cover the rock and win. So we're going to have paper going forward. It's going to go against scissors. Scissors are going to win. Then we're going to have scissors against paper. Scissors are going to win. We're going to have rock against scissors. Rock should win in the end because rock breaks scissors. Okay, so that's what it runs and says. So basically what I want to focus on then is just this little bit right here. So the first thing to realize is this pattern of just unwrapping a value, pulling it out, using it later, or returning nothing is actually a pretty common pattern in Haskell. It's so common, in fact, that this is kind of the monad behavior of options. And if the word monad scares you, don't be afraid. But basically, it means we can use this nice little operator called bind. Now, what bind will do is bind will unwrap a value from a context and allow you to rewrap that value in the same context. That's how I think of bind. That's how I've always kind of thought of bind. But basically, what, what, what do I mean by context? Well, by context, I mean maybe. The context of maybe means there may or may not be a value. That's all it means. That's what the context does for you. So what does that mean? That means if we have a value, we can unwrap it and try to rewrap it using bind. And why am I talking about bind? Well, we'll see soon. Basically, I'm going to write this in a really, really crazy way. Um, I'm going to bind out the value inside of this. So if we do bind this, this gives back the hands. And I'm going to use a lambda here in line just to kind of pull that value out. So then the next thing we want to do is we want to guard the repeats. And you'll notice this is kind of straightforward at this point. I'm kind of just um, repeating the same boilerplate at this point. And in the very end, we just want to play the hands. So this is how we might use bind. So basically we're saying parse the hands or parse the raw values, parse the hands out of the raw values. And then if there is a value, you can think of this part as here saying if there is a value, name that value hands and try to do some things with it. 
And then what are we going to do with hands? We're going to guard that there are no repeats against hands. And then we're going to um, use the unique hands to play a game. Now, I'm pretty sure to actually make this work, I need to insert dollar signs here just to wrap it in parens. So let me show you what that would look like really quick because it's kind of interesting. It would look basically like this. I'm not sure if this will work straight up. So I'm just going to wrap it in dollar signs. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and run this and make sure I didn't make a mistake. I probably did. <clears throat> Oops, I did. Um, maybe I do need parens. Let's try parens. Let's just do that. It's a little ugly, but it'll do. Okay, so that worked just fine. Uh, I bet I can't use dollar sign because it's not interacting well with this inlined operator. But anyways, so this is a very common pattern, unwrapping a value from a context and then rewrapping it. It doesn't, frankly, read a lot more nicely than the pattern matching. I mean, it's nice that we got rid of the nesting. But basically in Haskell, there's this thing called do notation, and do notation is just what you would call syntactic sugar for this pattern. So it works across anything that can be, that this bind operator can be used in. Um, and there's more to that than just that, you know, the monad is more of a complicated thing, but this is kind of the, ba the absolute basics of it. So basically, if we wanted to use do notation, we just throw a do here uh, on the first line, and that indicates to Haskell what's coming up is a block of code that's using do notation. <laughs> so basically, this whole thing then can boil down to, we can put hands in front, so things go in front, and we can get rid of all this bind. But basically, that's exactly the same pattern as we were doing before. It's just do notation gives us some nice little sugar for it. In fact, if you look at it, it looks a lot like assignment in imperative languages too, which is kind of interesting. Oh, and just to be clear, this is not a monad tutorial. This is about do notation. So <clears throat> we're going to do that. And then in the end, we're going to play with unique hands. So let's go ahead and run it and see what happens. And we get back just rock. So hopefully this was useful for you. If you have any recommendations or things that you would like to see, let me know. Thanks for watching.